Hello, everyone. Certainly glad to be here tonight. Hope you're doing well. Um, what we're going to do is I'm going to try to, uh, from now on, make some very short videos if possible. Um, of course, it depends on what you mean by short chain, right? So, but we'll get started. So, um, basically, we're going to ask this question To whom was John 14 through 16 spoken? Now, um, probably mostly likely everyone that I've ever come across believes it to be the apostles. But the question is, are we, are, should we, uh, should we make a modern day application to us today? Can we actually do that without violating the text? And I think that's a very important, um, very important to discuss this because as we're going to see it does involve how to interpret the scriptures uh, correctly and so that's what we're going to be doing so uh let's get started so our first slide of course is this you always got to remember these there's a lot of rules and in, in hermeneutics on how to interpret the bible but i would say probably one of the most uh two of the most fundamental are this one who's speaking and of course, we're going to see it's Jesus. And then number two, to whom is he speaking? And of course, we're going to see it's the, who we call the later, the apostles, right? And so that's very important, as we'll, as we'll find out. Now, uh, I'm going to give several reasons to show you <laughs> why the original audience is the apostles, but it's also going to be the case, I'm going to establish the case that it's the apostles only. I remember one time um, uh, I was teaching a Bible class actually in South Korea, and I actually had this Christian lady come up to me, and uh, I made this uh, argument that, uh, and that this was only to the apostles, and she said something to the effect of, you're shaking my faith. And I thought to myself, no, I'm not shaking your faith. I'm actually building your faith, knowing that Jesus, he is trying to uh, uh, give assurance to his disciples that, yes, he's going away, but he's sending another advocate. He's sending a defendant to help them, which would be the Holy Spirit, which would guide them into all truth and, and equip them with the gospel of Christ to go into all the world and preach the gospel. And so we'll see that as we go along. Now, the first reason, of course, this is to the disciples is we find it in John 13, 1 through 6. And you can read about how Jesus washed the disciples' feet. Um, we see that because, remember, if you compared that to Luke's account, you remember they were asking the question once again, who is the greatest among us? You know, they didn't, they didn't get it. They didn't get the nature of God's kingdom, that it's all about being a servant. That's the true measure of, of, of what we ought to be. You want true success, you need, you must become a servant. Remember how Jesus said, I came not to serve, but to, but to be, but to serve. I came not to be served, but to serve and to give my life a ransom for many, Mark 10, 45. And so we see that the original audience is that upper in the upper room. They just had the Passover. And we see Matthew 26, verse 20 says, When evening had come, he sat down with who? The twelve. In the evening, he came with the twelve. And then in Luke's account, Luke knows that these disciples are going to become what we call the apostles. So when the hour had come, he sat down and the twelve apostles with him. Now, here's the second reason that we know the original audience is the apostles is because of the specific names. So, for example, you have Simon Peter, and you can look at John 13, 6 through 12, verse 24, verse 36. Thomas is mentioned in verse five, chapter 14, verse 5. Philip is mentioned in chapter 14, verse 8. And Judas, who was not Iscariot, is mentioned in chapter 14, verse 22. And we know that to be what we would call the apostles, right? Third reason. Third reason is because toward the end of John 16, it is the disciples who are still being mentioned as the original audience. Uh, if you look at what it says here, at, at towards the end of what Jesus is saying, then some of his disciples said among themselves, what is this he, that he says to us? A little while and you will not see me, and again a little while and you will see me. And because I go to the Father, they said, therefore, what is this that he says a little while? We do not know what he's saying. 
And now, of course, you know, we understand because we can look at what the whole Bible teaches and that Jesus is going to the cross and then he's going to be resurrected and he's going to uh, be with them again. Number four, uh, we would say that there are some contextual indicators that could not apply to us today. So, for example, John 15, verse 27, where it says, Jesus said, and you also will bear witness because you have been with me from the beginning. I mean, really, how many of us could honestly say uh, that you have been with Jesus from his personal ministry that was 2,000 years ago? How many of us have been with Jesus that long? <laughs> and of course, the answer is no one has, right? And then John 16, 16, a little while and you will not see me, and again, a little while and you will see me because I go to the Father. I mean, who among of us can say that we've, we can really claim with absolute honesty that we've seen Jesus personally in the flesh. Well, none of us can, friends. None of us, if we're being honest. And the fifth reason is this, uh, and this I think is probably the strongest argument of all, uh, is that the Holy Spirit um, that's promised in in this context here of what we see is certainly not occurring today because, for example, the Holy Spirit is not reminding me of what Jesus personally taught on the earth. Now, he did that with the apostles. I know he did. In fact, in Acts 20, verse 35, um, and I know Paul is an exception, but he, he did become an apostle because he saw the risen Jesus. But it's really interesting, in Acts 20, verse 35, he quotes a statement that's even that's not even found in the gospel accounts, but Jesus did teach it. And he said, do you remember how Jesus said is more blessed to give than to receive? See, he, Paul was reminded by inspiration what Jesus had taught, even though he never, we know he didn't walk with Jesus during those three and a half years, but we do know that the Holy Spirit was directly guiding Paul. Number two, uh, you, you, see, you, you and I, we have to study God's Word. we got to be like those noble Bereans and, and search the Scriptures daily, whether those things are so. Uh, we see that the Holy Spirit is not directly guiding us by inspiration into all truth, because we know all truth was delivered in the first century A.D., friends. We know this because of, of uh, Jude verse 3, that the faith once for all, was delivered to the saints. See, the apostles were guided into all truth, all religious truth. The new covenant was finally established by Jesus Christ, and it was fully revealed through that first century A.D. And so that shows you, friends, by implication, that there is no other truth to that was to be given after the first century A.D. That means... That Roman Catholicism is wrong, that means Mormonism is wrong, that means Islam is wrong, Seventh-day Adventism is wrong, and all the other uh, religious groups that claim to have uh, this uh, supposed direct guidance by the Holy Spirit. We cannot have that today, friends. And then in number, uh, we see that you and I, we cannot bear witness. I mean, when, it, when you look at the context of what it means to bear a witness, they, they were to be an eyewitness of the Lord's resurrection. And and. Personally speaking, I've never seen Jesus Christ in the flesh. I've never seen him in his resurrected state. Therefore, uh, that is not applying to me today. But here's the thing. You can place your faith, place your absolute trust, your confidence in what? You in the reliable eyewitness testimony of those early disciples who did see Jesus resurrected from the dead. That's what John 20, verse uh, where Jesus said, Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believed. Um, so that's something we need to recognize. So here's how I would put it, friends. And I know this is a you know a little bit big, a little bit small, but just uh, please try to. We'll go through it very, um, we'll try to go through it. (laughs) So basically, if modern day Christians like myself directly receive the promise of the advocate, the Holy Spirit in John 14 through 16, then modern day Christians ought to be able to be taught all things directly, chapter 14, verse 26 of John, be reminded directly of what Jesus taught, bear witness, and also what that also meant, if you look at Hebrews 2, 1 through 4, is they had to do miracles, friends, and we're not doing miracles today because they had been with Jesus from the beginning of his ministry. 
um, that Jesus is now with them, and yet Jesus is about to depart so that the Holy Spirit might be dispatched. Now, friends, we know that that originally is meant for the apostles. We, we know this. We know that Jesus was with them, but he was about to leave them, and he would leave them the Holy Spirit to guide them in all truth. And that's what the next one is, to be guided directly into all truth and predict things to come, to tell the future. Friend, I cannot tell the future. I am not a prophet, and neither is anyone else today also. So modern-day Christians are not able to do all these things. So therefore, the conclusion that we should logically come to is, therefore, modern-day Christians do not directly receive the promise of the Advocate of the Holy Spirit in John 14 through 16. Now, there might be some of people out there who believe this. They'll say, well, okay, yes, it was originally given to the apostles, but it does apply to us today. Okay, what do you mean? Uh, I like to know ex- exactly what you mean, because I I even admit there are a lot of great moral truths that are taught there in John 14 through 16. But the reason I believe in those moral truths is because they are taught elsewhere in the scriptures, friends. That's why we ought to believe. So these are you'll see that these are permanent commands that exist beyond the age of the miraculous um, because we know that the age of miracles was limited to the first century and we got, I'm sure I've done videos on 1 Corinthians 13 and Ephesians 4 in the past, so you can look those up on the YouTube page. Um, so the principles that are taught, what are some principles that we can learn, friends, from what is taught there in John 13 through 16 that's also taught elsewhere in Scripture? Well, you can think about how we should ought to have a heart of a servant. That's something that's permanent, a permanent command. We're to render good acts of benevolence unto people. We're to be faithful servants and do good unto others. Do good unto all men, especially those of the household of faith. To visit orphans and widows and keep oneself unspotted from the world. To love one another, because that's how you're going to show you're a disciple of Jesus, is what we love each other. We do what is best for one another. We see that the greatest command is that we're to love our neighbor as ourselves, right? If we buy, we are to love one another. And that's what is also taught elsewhere in Scripture. We're to continue to believe in the Father and Son. As Jesus would say, if you believe in the Father, believe also in me. Yes, we, if we are to believe in the Father, we believe in Christ. If we truly love Jesus, if you love me, keep my commandments. That's certainly something we ought to keep. Especially it's taught in First John a lot. And we're able to have that peace that passes all understanding, that the world doesn't understand, that the world does not experience like you and I have experienced it. Because we understand what it means to have that great and harmonious relationship with the God of heaven. Because our sins have been forgiven. We've been washed in the blood of Christ and we have been redeemed. And we have that great joy that no one can take away from us. We are to continue to abide in Jesus and his words. That's certainly something that's taught elsewhere in Scripture, that we're to abide in him. We're to have a relationship with Jesus. We're to abide in the love of Jesus. We're to not let our joy be taken away from us. We're to be known as Jesus' friends. If you're, you are my friends, if you do whatsoever, I command you. We're to go out and bear fruit that makes a lasting impact for Jesus. We're to bear fruit, friends. We're to develop what, what is called the fruit of the Spirit. Galatians 5, 22 and 23. We're to remember that we're servants of Jesus and the world will hate us even to the point of persecuting us. We see that that is a truth that is taught elsewhere in Scripture, but we see that it is indeed a reality even today. We're to remember that we might experience tribulation, but we can have peace, that that joy that he, that Jesus offers, right? I love John 16, 33. Be of good cheer. You will have tribulation. Uh, um, let me go to that text if you don't mind. I want to see what, I mean, I get the exact wording of that. Sorry, I totally uh, did wrong on that. I want to quote what Jesus said there. And he says, 
These things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. Amen, somebody. All right, so um, going back to our slides here. Uh, where to, uh, where to, sorry, I already had that one. So as you can see, there's lots of principles taught there in John 13 through 16 that you and I to are abide in and that are because they're taught elsewhere in Scripture, friends. And you can see here that this argument makes sense, that if the apostles directly receive the promise of the advocate, the Holy Spirit in John 14 through 16, then the apostles ought to be able to be taught all things directly. And they were. I mean, we see in Acts 2, 1 through 4, they were filled with the Holy Spirit. Peter preached that first great gospel sermon. To be reminded directly of what Jesus taught. We saw an example of that with Paul in Acts 20, verse 35. To bear witness by miracle sign, wonders and signs, because they had been with Jesus from the beginning of his ministry. And certainly they, they did bear witness, friends. They were they had been with Jesus since the beginning of his ministry. That Jesus is now with was now with was was with them, and yet he was taken away from them. But he Jesus sent the Holy Spirit to be with them. So that we see that in John sixteen verse seven, they were directly guided into all truth, and they were indeed able to predict things to come. I think about. So things like Paul, Ephesians, uh, Acts 20, uh, 2 Thessalonians 2, he predicted things to come. Now the Spirit expressly says some will depart from the faith, giving heed to the seeing spirits and doctrines of demons. That's something that's giving the future of what's going to happen. And so, therefore, the apostles do directly receive the promise of the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, in John 14 through 16. I hope this has been a uh, blessing to you. Uh, the next thing we're going to be looking at uh, is... Um, baptism formula. So stay tuned. Thank you so much and God bless.